So Barry, what is a superager? Okay, a superager is um, is a coin is a term uh, that was developed by a prof, um, a neurobiologist by the name of Rogowski uh, about mm, I would say five year ten years ago, and based on a study, they found that there were people in their eighties and nineties that had the brains of a 50, 40, 50 year old. And they wanted to know why. And you've seen these people. I mean, you know, your grandmother, great, great grandmother, father, and they seem to be just as sharp as ever. And uh, so what they found out that these people that were 30 years younger by giving them cognitive tests and everything, that uh, they, um, did an autopsy on the one that passed away. And they found they had a larger anterior cingulate cortex. Now this is a part of the brain that regulates emotions. It is also the part of the brain that you grieve and you experience pain. It's also the part of the brain that uh, regulates love and fear. So we talk about love and fear. I think it is a matter of uh, how you handle love and how you handle fear is an important part of the anterior, anterior cingulate cortex. But I, the most interesting thing a part of uh, is anterior cingulate cortex uh, as near the, what they call the uh, ins uh, insula cortex. And these are the home of the largest neurons in the brain. These are called the von Economo neurons. Now these neurons have been found in apes as well as elephants, and they call them the social neurons. And so they found out, interesting enough, that the superagers had five times as many von Economo neurons as the average person did. They also had found that they had a thicker prefrontal cortex is what's called the executive function of the brain where we, and we also regulate our emotions with our, uh, with our prefrontal cortex. You know, like if you see something like a lion or, a, or somebody that's gonna attack you, your eyes see it and you smell it and you hear it and, it and it comes up your spinal column, that's where your senses go and it goes right to your amygdala well, if you learn how to bypass the amygdala and go to the prefrontal cortex, if it's not really a dangerous situation, then you don't get upset about it. And, it's, and that's where if you can train yourself to do that. But what's really interesting about these von Economo neurons, it turns out they do things, they, they actually activate, when they're activated, they, they send out information to all parts of the brain. They are the largest, like I said, the largest neurons and they're the fastest neurons. So what's really interesting about it is the fellow that found these neurons back in the 1800s, around 1850, I think, his name was von Economo. That's why they call him the von Economo neurons. And he was a German, I believe. And he was, a, and he was, and they named these neurons. So if you can find any neurons, they'll name them after you. But uh, uh, the most, the other exciting thing is, is some people that had evidence of um, Alzheimer's, the tangles that they that they associate with uh, uh, Alzheimer's, but they had uh, these superagers had evidence of it, but not the symptoms. And the theory is that these von Economo neurons are like, uh, they, if they use them and they increase them, it causes like a bypass. Like if you're on a freeway and I've been on my freeway with my car and I, I had a GPS and there was a, and the GPS said, there's a wreck up there. And, and, it, and I said, yeah, well, I'll find another route. And it pulls over and, and exit and takes me around the wreck. And that's what, these uh, von Economo neurons do is they take you around those jams in the brain. So you can get, so you can send information to the parts that, um, that count. So the really, so you ask the basic question. I'm always, as an engineer, I'm always interested in, 
the application of science. What is the brain for? The brain's purpose is to serve the rest of the body. The brain is not the master of the body, it's the servant of the body. And when we think of it that way, then that means in order to activate and use the brain, we need to use our body. So that's what oh, a super agent okay. is. Okay, excellent, excellent. Now, what I want to do is um, I want to talk briefly about your background. So, you know, before retirement, you had this amazing career as a power engineer. Now I identify with that because my dad was a power engineer. He built, uh, you know, hydroelectric plants. I myself studied, uh, you know, I was, I have a bachelor's in electrical and computer engineering. So I studied power systems. It's a very powerful field. And, uh, you know, you worked at Bonneville. So I, I still remember my visit to Bonneville, how amazing uh, that place is. So, um, you talked, you talked to me about how human beings are like power systems. So, and you, you thought of it, you know, your own body and your own life as a battery power system. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Um, so I'm to go skip over here. So the Bonneville power system was, so I had a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Arizona State University. And then when I went and I worked for Westinghouse for three years after I retired, and I wanted to be an electronic engineer. And they actually had me working at a plant in integrated circuits, but they didn't want me to work there. They wanted me to be a transformer engineers. Now transformers are, they convert voltage from, uh, if it's at the generator, from a low voltage, like 13.8 kV to like 500,000 volts. And so it can be transmitted efficiently long distance. It's also, you can find them on small poles throughout uh, uh, your, your, near your house. And it steps down the voltage so it can be handled in your home. So these, and they also are found when you have a hurricane, they often blow up and make big sparks. Mm -hmm. So I was a transformer engineer and this was back in the 1960s, like 1968. And they did it all by slide rule. Now, in order to design a transformer, you have to use these complicated formulas that take an electrical and mechanical of a, of a, you know, of the transformer specifications. And when I did this, there was a guy wandering around saying he was going to design computers programs so that it could be done on a computer. And all these other power engineers, uh, designers, oh, no, no, I don't want to lose my job. I said, yeah, I want to lose my job. I want to be, this is the most boring <laughs> job I could imagine. Well, it was in Indiana where I worked. So I, I, um, I saved my money. My wife was a school teacher and she, we saved, we didn't spend her money. And I went to Purdue for a year and got a master's in electrical engineering and quit Westinghouse. And, uh, and then I, and I got all kinds of offers and I looked out there and I said, Oregon is the most beautiful place I can imagine in the world. And I never been to Oregon. So I got a job offer from Bonneville Power as a GS 12, which is a very good salary. And uh, so Bonneville Power was created back in during uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, administration to utilize electricity on the Columbia River. So it's a bulk power supplier. It sells power to uh, utilities who intend sell it to retail users and factories. But it's a federal agency located in Portland, Oregon. So this is a picture of Bonneville power system and it has transmission lines and you can see the transformers. You can see the electricity going being stepped down to your house. So when my wife died, I had all these emotions and I had all these issues and I, and I said, boy, my engineering experience is not helping me very well in dealing with this emotions, the, the pain of grief and, and being upset and angry and everything. Then I came up with this idea. 
that my wife was the regulator of my slice gate. That's the slice gate at every dam that controls a flow of water that drops and turns the turbine to then sends electricity out through the transmission system to your home. She no longer was able to do that. And because I, she's gone and I was grieving, I had a big storm and the dam was overflowing. So I needed to have my own slice gate and I, and I need to regulate my own slice gate. And so that's what I did. I, so this picture here shows my nervous system. It shows my grandchildren in my backyard apple tree. I had two grandsons and it shows me doing yoga. So I picked up yoga. I picked up uh, painting. I picked up um, uh, playing the piano, writing poetry. These are things I dabbled in all my life, but I never did them all at once. And that's when I formed Barry University. And Barry University, I'll go back here. Am I, am I moving ahead? Uh, okay. No, you're, you're, you're just zooming in. Oh, there you are. Yeah, we, we got, yeah. We, we, are, we are at Barry University. Go ahead. So Barry University is where I'm the student and the dean and the chancellor. And if uh, I don't like the teachers, I fire them. <laughs> Wonderful. And, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. No, I, I'm, I'm, when, when I told, when you told me about it, uh, I mean, I said, that, that's what everybody needs to do. They need to create their own university, direct their own university and be a very, very demanding student. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I, and I hired my own, and they come to my house instead of my going to the school and there's no test. Mm -hmm. The test is really the teacher. If they do a good job of teaching, they keep they get paid, but I don't get tested. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a great risk. <laughs> so what's the what's the range of um, what's the range of uh, subjects that you studied? Well, I studied yoga. I had a private yoga teacher. I had a guitar teacher. Mm -hmm. I had a art teacher, and. Um, Piano and teacher. a piano teacher um, and uh, I had dabbled in these things before but I never had them concentrated my wife was a school teacher she also was an artist and before she passed away she was on dialysis and she came and so I had to hire the art teachers and got into yoga you know when she, as she, I was her caregiver for several years before she died and I found that was a real issue. I mean, I looked to my wife for emotional support, but I needed to support her, but I had nobody to support me. Mm -hmm. Well, my reaction was to, you know, turn to ways of learning how to support myself. I never found success in turning to other people to support me. Mm -hmm. I tried a psychotherapist. And uh, after she died, I met with him 12 times and he started yawning while I was talking about my life. And I said, you know, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to, to learn how to get over this grief. And I fired him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, this is ridiculous. And so I, that's, I, I found the Barry University approach worked much better. And then I had a counselor that came to my house once a week and he would look at my paintings. I have about 25 of them I've done since then. And incidentally, since the pandemic, I've even been more prolific. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Um, now, this is quite a switch from being a power engineer uh, to getting into arts and all kinds of you know, humanities. What, what was that like? What's, what was that switch like? It was uh, very pleasing, and because I wrote, I wrote two books. I, you know, I wrote a book called, I wrote a book called Transformer Efficiency, uh, Efficient Power Transformers. Then I wrote another book called Power Quality Primer. They're both McGraw Hill books, and I want to tell you up front, I was exhausted emotionally after I wrote them. And I didn't want to talk about the subject at all after I wrote them. 
-hmm. And I said, what is wrong here? And I was in the process of writing a third book called The Smart Grid, which is a very popular subject now. And, uh, and, I, and I had all arranged to write it. I would, I would have a chapter all arranged and a binder for each chapter. And, and I'd write so many words every day and all this, you know, I had it all planned out. And I said, this is ridiculous. I am writing, but I end up emotionally. And so I found out after I took, I read a book by Elaine Aaron, it's called Highly Sensitive Person. And I took the test and I, ran, I was off scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I also, I found, I, I found out about this guy I talked about earlier is Dr. Drabonsky, a Polish psychologist. And I took a test in his book and he has five overexcitabilities, psychomotor, emotional, intellectual, um, see what is the other one's um, psychomotor and uh, imaginational and sensual. And I took the test and I have all five of them. Wow. <laughs> so the problem is I was regulating my intellectual part being an engineer, but I was ignoring all these four, other four. And so that's why I came up with the concept of Barry's power system. It allows me to treat all these overexcitabilities as a system. And so that's really what made me hire all these teachers. I wanted to hire a teacher that would help me with my psychomotor yoga. And I, went, and I took up dancing with my girlfriend. And then I wanted to, I had no trouble with the intellectual. I was already, and then I needed to do art to help me with my emotional and my imagination. And uh, then I needed to do, uh, uh, then I needed to change my environment to deal with my sensitivity because highly sensitive, pe sensitive people pick up everything. And I was doing that. So uh, can we jump ahead to your environment? How, how did you set up your house to make sure that it supports your creativity? Sure. So this is a picture I have here. I could take you a tour of it. I'm right down the bay, but I, I, uh, I was in the process this summer of trying to find the best place to do yoga. And so I designed a meditation garden in my backyard. And I found out I, when I did yoga outside on the ground, it was much more calming. But then, uh, then the winter came and the pandemic came and I had to move indoors. So I got the idea of moving the outdoors indoors. So I bought a couple of uh, majestic palms. You can see this there in, in here. And then I bought a, a lily plant and then I have a poinsettia. And then I, I was gonna peer, put a mirror on my yard, backyard, yard, but instead I brought it inside and I put up against these bookcases instead of having my books like you do in the background, I have them covered by, I, I find looking at books as, as like uh, catnip. And I cannot help when I look at a book, I wanna read it. And, and so, so I found if I cover it up, I don't have all this distraction and covered it up with plants and a trail. And uh, then I'd, so that's what I did. And then I, I had these uh, lights that I was gonna put out in my backyard and I decided to put those in my in my uh, garden or my, and then I bought, I have a yoga mat here that looks like a um, Zen garden. So then you see the problem is there, there is a part of the brain, this anterior cingulate cortex, it's also called the default. And when you're calm after doing yoga, then you start daydreaming, you start getting ideas. And as an INTJ, I start planning those ideas but the problem is if you're just out in the woods somewhere, you can't do anything with those ideas. So I got the idea of bringing my creative tools next to my garden. So I, so I could, uh, oh my God, another INTJ. <laughs> Somebody wrong. <laughs> so, so, so I flow from my yoga to my art table and from my art table to my 
uh, oh. piano and from my piano to my writing chair. So that's what I found very, and that is, you know, that is what's really has been very, made me very happy during that pandemic while everybody, everybody else is, you know, burned out and, and going nuts. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. I want to uh, ask you about one thing, uh, because what you did was that you systematically developed different aspects of yourself, like sensory motor aspect, you know, aesthetic aspect. And what is, is there a synergy between these? You know, does one of them help you in all the others? Like if you improve on sensory motor, for example, like yoga, how, you know, is, is there a synergy between all of these activities? Yes. And if I go back to my power system metaphor and I treat my emotions like the water behind the dam. Mm -hmm. I treat the generator as my brain because it generates thoughts. And I treat my thoughts like uh, the electrical uh, electrons. They're neurons, but they're electrons. And, and then I treat my nervous system as my, as my transmission system. But it's my imagination because when you, when you meditate or when you focus on something you it causes you to do something or not to do something it activates a part of the brain and the body and so and then i and i go back to what i said originally the purpose of the brain is to is to serve the body and so by uh peace lily <laughs> and so i find by doing yoga that is a, it's what's called movement meditation. So it's, it's, it's satisfying the psychomotor, but also it is calming me down through the meditation. And so I find walking is the same thing, you know, any kind of, but I find running or, or an exercise that involves a lot of uh, exertion, it, it tends to make it your adrenaline up it does not help you in, you know, in your creative activities. Excellent. So, you know, so go ahead. Um, one of the observations that you made was that achieving a calm state is a prerequisite to creativity. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Uh, so what is really interesting about it, they did a, there's an article in, in a magazine, I think it was just a few years ago, and it's found out that uh, there is three parts of the brain, called, one's called the, the default brain, part of the brain. That's the part of the brain that's called the daydreaming. And then there is the uh, prefrontal cortex is what is called the executive part. Then there's the salient part of the brain. Okay. And the salient part decides which one you use. Most people, they, they use executive, they switch back and forth. But I tend to be one of those weird ones who, when I, when I don't switch back and forth, I, when I'm calm and daydreaming, I also use my executive and plan it. But the problem is, if I'm not calm, I'm using my executive to do things that are not uh, creative because my calming part is, is totally taken over by the prefrontal cortex. So, that's why I find it's better to get calm first. Then it, it's, it's like uh, those von Economo neurons are just laying around doing nothing in that anterior cingulate cortex. But as soon as I start calming myself down, hey, I wake up and get out of the hamper and, and dust. And I said, and I say, hey, go over there, go over there, do something over there. And, you know, and otherwise those von Economo neurons, they get sleepy and they, and it's what they say, if you don't use it, you lose it. Beautiful. One other metaphor that you have that I really like is that of a spiral staircase. Could you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I got a picture of that. And, and I, let's see here. And I even have a poem to go Please. with that. Here it goes. Here's a picture of it. And uh, so I'm, I'm actually... Yeah, we're, we're there. I'm actually working on a uh, painting. It's not a painting I've completed. But it's uh, it's in my garden, and I have a tree. I have a dogry tree in my garden, and um, and then I uh, 
build a spiral staircase. So the big advantage of a spiral staircase concept of learning is when you're in a spiral staircase, you can see where you're at, where you've been and where you're going. And so that is the ideal uh, way of learning. Learning is not a, what you call a linear process, if you especially if you're learning uh, things that are that involve practice. And um, so I'm gonna read you a poem. I'm gonna find it in here somewhere. Here it is. I, so this is called the spiral, life spiral path. You do the math. Life is not a linear path. It's a spiral you see. You walk up and incline, you end up behind. Again, you try the same way until you get more smart one day. You learn a better way. <clears throat> you spiral up to a new level. That's when you climb, reach higher than your prime. Get wise, my friend, or you'll end up where you begin. Wonderful, wonderful, excellent. Um, so uh, I've always loved your poems. So tell me a little bit about your poems. Why, why do you write poems? What does that do for you? And what, what kind of an art is poem to you? So I find out as when I was uh, working as an engineer, there was usually three things that you required to, to uh, design and use a, a uh, project. And you usually did a blueprint. I, when I was working as a power system engineer, I drew a uh, a diagram of the of the transformers and the substation and the transmission lines and I that way I could estimate it and I could get information on the distances and the so like any architect you have to do a blueprint but uh, and that's what I call my paintings and so in order to build what you do you have to write a specification so I call my poems my specification and I keep four I keep five journals a day and uh, and I call them my operating manuals and and uh, and the thing about poetry is it condenses complex concepts into simple easy understood language but it makes it easy to remember because poetry is for some reason just like songs you can, you can remember, your brain seems to retain it better. And so as a result, these concepts, I want to, so my, my paintings are really visions of what I want to accomplish. They're blueprints. Mm -hmm. My specifications are, are my poems and it's how to get there, mm -hmm. how to accomplish what my vision is. Mm -hmm. And in my, and then you back up to my journaling is it's checking me day by day and being mindful that I'm really progressing along the path of my specifications to reach my vision in my paintings. Wonderful. So I want to ask you a question. Um, you've done, I mean, it's amazing. It looks like you're getting younger and younger because I watched your <laughs> video that you did two years ago. Your, your enthusiasm has just kept on spiraling up. So that's, that's great. Um, <laughs> now, my question to you is, how can somebody else do this? What, what, why is it that, because I've seen many people, you know, after they retire, they kind of do something which just occupies time, which is very different. So how, you know, especially after retirement, what do you recommend to people? How can anybody do this? Uh, well, my doctor talks to me because he has a, his parents are a little, uh, he, my doctor's about your age. And, uh, and I tell him all the things I'm doing and he talks about his parents are a little bit older than me and, and they're, they're not doing all these things. So it's, it's like the dream I had, uh, not last, night before last. And I have a lot of, and so I, I have a dream journal. One of this dream, I was riding in a bus, but I was on a zip line in the bus. And so if you're, if you're on a zip line in a bus, you're not gonna go anywhere. You're gonna go where the bus goes. And so that's a, that's a metaphor that, if, that the problem with older people 
in our culture in particular is they expect you to be fragile. They expect you to be slow. They expect you to be um, um, not very smart. They expect you to be like a child. And that is when you ride on the bus. But if you wanna be on the zip line, you need to get out of the bus and build your own zip line outside. Mm -hmm. And so the point is, the key is, is not to be, uh, let other people uh, form who you are. Well, it turns out I have another thing. Barry Kaufman wrote about this. I was reading about this. He's written a couple of books. One's called Wired, Wired to uh, Create. His latest book called Transcend. And I met him at one of the conferences I spoke at. And he's, he's basically says that there are some people who have an independent mindset and a growth mindset. When they are rejected, they get more creative. So my motto is, and this is a, the key to it all, is social rejection fuels my creative redemption. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so Barry, this is fantastic. Now I'm going to give a chance for people to ask questions. Give me okay. just a second here. Can we stop sharing the slides so we can see everybody properly? All right, folks. So it's time for Q&A. You get to ask Barry questions. Um, as always, we've got four rules. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to ask a question. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. Uh, and number four, be courteous. Um, Linda first. Linda, go ahead. Barry, do you have a schedule for each day? You know, do you do yoga first, art, or do you do you kind of do what you feel you want to do first? No, I'm a very schedule. I, I, of course, schedules I develop based on what works best for me because one of the problems is 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 I like to be efficient and I like to be effective. That's part of being an INTJ, and. That's why it's important I have a SES system because if, you, if you're trying to be efficient, often sometimes you, you'd get in a rut. And so what I do is uh, I have a wonderful girlfriend who's fixing breakfast. And while, I'm fixing, while she's fixing breakfast, I'm writing in my journals and, I, and I'm writing about my dreams. And then throughout the day, uh, I just kind of do the things that have to be done but maybe an hour or two before I go to bed, that's when I do yoga and that's when I do my painting and that's when I do my piano playing and uh, before I go to bed. And then, then I find my dreams are more uh, positive and it makes my, my subconscious happy. <laughs> and, uh, and I go to bed grounded rather than agitated. <laughs> Now, do you have a goal for every day that you must do certain things? Like, must you play the piano every day? Must you paint every day? Uh, I like to. I, I, that's, I am doing yoga every day uh, since the pandemic. I wasn't doing this. Uh, and uh, I used to do that, but I found that that kind of made me unhappy. So I kind of, after I do yoga, I do what the, my brain wants me to do what my body wants me to do, what my, and, uh, and it's what I feel like doing. And, and while I'm doing yoga, I'm thinking about, but I have a project that I'm doing already. And I, I keep, I gotta be honest with you in the morning, I, I write, I have also a journal called my painting journal and my writing journal. And so I, I write in my journal what my plan is and, and it's not always easy to paint something. You have to think ahead on what, what you colors you put on first and what layers. And, and I look at YouTube videos and everything, you know, I don't have teachers in them. Incidentally, I, I uh, got rid of my teachers and, yeah. and uh, but once the pandemic had my yoga teacher, you know, she says, you're ready to do it by yourself. And so I do, you know, I do, I'm an autodidact now. I teach it all. I look on YouTube a lot. And uh, so not so much anymore, but I, once I get a, uh, once I get an idea, the idea motivates me th more than my scheduling myself. Does that make sense? And that's, I took a, I took a personality test and, 
my personality is I'm motivated by bringing ideas to fruition. So the more I have clarity of my idea, I don't have to uh, schedule my, I want to do it. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Barry, and great question, Linda. Next up is Kevin, Alicia, Joe, Jyoti, and Kevin. Uh, other Kevin. So, uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin Callahan or the other? Uh, Kevin? Let's start with Kevin Callahan. That's fine. And then we'll go to the other Kevin immediately afterwards. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, Barry, it seems to me, even though you're describing yourself, and I believe you are an introvert, that you're, you've built into your system a lot of social interaction. And, you know, you have an audience that you're relating to. You're teaching. Uh, you have coaches. And the reason I bring this up is <clears throat> I, I've spent 10 years with World War II generation guys. So you're like a youngster for those guys. But if you see them walk into a room, uh, you know, they're like bent over and, you know, what you're describing as slow and everything. Well, if you get a group of them together <clears throat> for like a luncheon, um, they're like they're 18 years old again, you know, when they start talking about World War II experiences and so forth. So um, I think social interaction is also important. And it seems to me you've sort of built that into what you're doing. Um, it requires an audience is, is what I'm seeing, uh, that you're relating uh, your thoughts and your thinking and your painting and, and the various things to other people. So I wonder if you're under underestimating the value of the social interactions which you have built into your system. No, I don't. I don't think of un, underestimating. I think I've I've grown older and I realize that uh, I have another painting where I I have somebody uh, trying to get into my fence while I was doing yoga, and I I've learned to be selective uh, my social interactions. For instance, uh, um, I was while well, my wife after she died, I joined a a. Um, a group of widows and widowers. And I was sharing with this one woman, my, uh, my grieving painting. And she said, Barry, when are you gonna stop this SHIT? <laughs> and another man, I read a poem that I wrote about my missing my wife and he made fun of it. So I'm telling you, I have to be very careful of who I socialize with. The reason I'm in your group, uh, in this group is because I was in a writer's group and one person said, yeah, Barry, you're a genius. I'll be glad when you're no longer in our group. And I said, oh, to myself, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave this. It's not worth getting into a fight with him. So I'm saying they gotta be careful about who you socialize with. And, and, I, and so I find out you, you and my children, they're, they, all they can do is make fun of what I do. Uh, one makes bullies me about my paintings. Another one doesn't want to even see me once I start talking about my dancing and making presentations. So, um, but that just makes me more creative. And uh, my redemption is my creativity. So I got to be careful who I'm around. When I, after my wife uh, died, I, I went to poets group and would read my poems and and show my paintings and the other poets got kind of jealous because they didn't paint. So you gotta be careful who you be around and, and uh, especially you gotta be selective, I guess. It's so social, in my experience, socializing indiscriminately without setting boundaries is a dangerous activity. Thank you, Barry. Uh, next up is Kevin, Alicia, Joe, Jyoti and Maxine. Uh, Kevin Sue, go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Srinka. Thank you, our super ager here. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry to hear, before my question, I'm sorry to hear uh, some people, you know, uh, biased to yourself, even your, your lovely kids. They, they are wrong. Uh, I can't, uh, you know, hear this group approves who you are, you, you know. When I saw you immediately you, you talking, I was right away inspired. That's why that day I remember I talked to Mr. Anka. We cannot wait. I cannot wait, you know, you know, can we let him give a presentation? My question is this. My question is big. I treat you here like one leader about today. If you can redefine your life, 
as a system, or let's see, you want to join the blueprint actually from the age one. Let's see, what change do you want to the design your, your life better? Let's see. Let's see. From what? let's see, from you go to school, get a marriage with your life, uh, with your wife, then you enjoy. What what can you do different? Let's see, your previous years. You thank you. So you're asking what should I've done differently than, than yeah. my past? Yeah, your past, your past. Let's see, you know. Yeah, I think I shouldn't have messed around with people that are so negative. I shouldn't have been on that bus that was running my zip line up and down. That was just frustrating me. And I had a lot of dreams about it. And the pain of rejection is very painful. And uh, and so uh, it's taking a lot of time for me to, to be, because my parents even, uh, they rejected me because they didn't want me to get a master's degree. And even after my father died, my mother, I tell about the things I did and she changed the subject to talk about my father. So it's the, there's a book called The Drama of the Gifted Child. And, and I've experienced all that. It's uh, uh, with the, so there is a book out now called uh, highly sensitive, intense people, and it's by a woman named uh, Emma, I M O L L I M I, and uh, uh, and she she says in there that your family and your small group are probably the ones you should stay away from, and it's larger groups that you should look forward to. I found out that I joined, uh, I got involved in the local, it's right next to where I live. And I joined the uh, Senior Citizen Center. And it was nothing but a bunch of clicks. And they're always biting at each other. And, and if you're highly sensitive and you're intense, this is not a very healthy thing. But I find also, if you spend a lot of your energy socializing, you have very little energy left to actualize. And that, you know, we can sit here and argue about it all we want, but I think you make a choice. You can give so much energy to socializing and those people, they become like the other people. And I don't want to be like other people. I want to be like me. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, you next go. up thank is you. Alicia, uh, Joe, uh, and Ed is next, Alicia. Hi, Barry. Thank you so much for this talk. It was actually very interesting and good for a person who's, you know, just kind of starting to embark on life in this glorious way that you have. And I really appreciate that you are able to balance your right and left brain activities and that you're still maintaining structure, but you're finding that flow. As a person who has a struggle with that, I think that you relaying how important it is to incorporate those areas of your life is inspiring and thank you for that. I wanted to ask you, when I see that you're doing a lot of writing, especially creative writing, and so is that, do you prefer to use a laptop because I know you've published books or do you usually write in your journal and how does that affect your creative flow? Uh, well, I found out there's a book uh, uh, called Write It Down and Make It Happen. And I found out when I write things longhand uh, that, it, that this, in this book it says it activates your rectilinear, um, uh, act, it's a rectilinear system. It, it's a part of the brain back here, back behind your, mm -hmm. by, in the back. And it's kind of like your radar. And like when you buy a Honda, she says in her books, and you look around, all you see is Hondas. And uh, so when you write it down, it activates this a part of your brain. And so you start doing the things you wrote down. And so when I write, when I write not only in my, especially in my journals, I gotta be careful what I write down because it does activate me. It influences my behavior. And so the same thing, that's what I was experienced writing about transformers and things that did not relate to me. So I was using all my energy doing things had nothing to do with me. I'm not a transformer. I'm not a power system. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a house. I'm a person. 
And so when I start writing about myself, I start changing myself to fit what I want to be. And that's what Drabonsky is all about, is we all have an ideal we want to be. And he believes, and I believe too, that we can choose to be whoever we want to be as long as we put the energy and effort to it. And uh, rather than what somebody else wants us to be or who we think somebody else, that is really the key, I think, to, to happiness is, is and to flow, flow is happiness, most uh, psychologists say, and is to be who you are, authentic, being authentic. Being yourself. Thank you. This is like heresy to a lot of people. I mean, it's heresy to say, be yourself. You know, we see movies about it all the time, but very, very few people do it. Thank you so much, Barry. That was very helpful. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is Joe. Hi, very fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. Do you ever get obsessed with a problem and become hyper focused and fall out of balance and what do you do in order to counter that so what is the check that you have that maybe you're just so interested in one particular thing but it's starting to you know cause you to be out of balance well i think that's why that's where yoga and and doing and it's so the the key to being a super ager is to push yourself is to, is to not do something that's so difficult that you get frustrated, but do something that's a little bit more difficult in what you're doing. That's the key. That's the key how you build new circuits in your brain. And, uh, and so uh, if that's your goal and you, and you start writing your journal, I'm working on this problem, then you're in a rut and you need to, and you need to be aware of yourself. So self-awareness and being mindful is a very important part of doing that. And, and I had to grow into that because my tendency, and I especially find out in groups because I'm an empathy, empathetic, I pick up other people's problems, emotional problems, and then I try to solve them. But they're not my problems. I can't solve them. And, and when I start talking about other people, I say, uh-oh, mm -hmm. I'm doing it again. And I stop doing it. And I was like Britney Spears, I'm doing it again. <laughs> and, uh, and so I write down in my journal, stop doing that, Barry. And that, so my journal is like a supervisor that's regulating my behavior and my emotions. I really advocating journaling is really a very significant, it's, it can become your own psychotherapist that way. Well, uh, thank you, Barry. This is just incredible. Excellent. Uh, next up is Ed, Jyoti, uh, Maxine, Jeff, Mushki, and David. Uh, Ed, go ahead. Hey, Barry, I really appreciate where you're coming from. I'm really glad I uh, got into this uh, discussion today. Um, I'm a, sort of a sensitive iconoclast. And I march to my own drummer, more or less. And uh, I, I really was glad to see see or hear how a rejection uh, you've used as a positive. I think that's really important to be able to uh, withstand uh, rejection and develop your own way rather than you know, following kind of a herd you know, mentality. And being a retired guy myself who is kind of peripatetic, uh, I don't want to be part of the herd. I want to be you know, in my own distinct group. And uh, uh, it's, is it always easy to uh, accept rejection? I, I still find that uh, uh, difficult, but yet when I have been rejected, I found that it has uh, built me up and improved me. Yeah, and I, especially the, my daughter, uh, I took my girlfriend, I haven't seen my, what is it, since, what is it, 2017? 2017. Or 16, or was it 16? No, it was 16. Yeah. It's been four years since I seen my two grandsons. Uh, my daughter just cut me off totally. And, uh, and, uh, and I think this is a common thing. Uh, most of your older children uh, don't accept their, 
uh, the father or mother marrying somebody else. You, they feel very, and, uh, but I was really close to one of my grandsons. He's an INTJ, just like me, but I was so close. This made me a threat to my, I believe, to my daughter and her mother-in-law. And uh, so I, what I have found is if I'm doing activities that focus my mind on them, then the rejection doesn't become a problem. But it, if you're not doing anything, it's easy to fall into that. And, and, and my dreams are really a helpful because when I start dreaming about things, it's, a, it's like a red flag, you know? And, uh, and, I, and I mean, it's a constant battle because we live in this culture that want to make older people infantile. So when we go dancing, my girlfriend and I go dancing when before the pandemic, almost one or twice a week, and we usually with younger people, they like to take, oh, that's cute, that's adorable. Uh, and, I, and I said, you know, uh, babies are cute and puppies are adorable, but we're adults, treat us like one. And, uh, and uh, so we have this culture that wants to make uh, older people infantile. And this is a real, it's called ageism. It's not like, it's, it's like the racism for older people. And, uh, and we're discriminated because of it. I, and so that's one reason, that's, that's my big thing. That's why I'm talking about being a super ager. I think the way we fight ageism is to tell these younger people, we're just as smart as you and if not smarter and treat us as such. Wonderful. Uh, next up is Jyoti, Maxine and Jeff. Jyoti, go ahead. Uh, Barry, your presentation resonates very closely to me. Two years ago, I lost my husband and uh, my, my whole life changed dramatically because I had to now, uh, first I was a caregiver like yourself, then I had to handle his business and I had some ideas about what I wanted to do. So I did not know in what direction to go, but you'll be surprised how people mm -hmm. I connected with gave me some ideas. For instance, they told me, oh, you don't look your age, you're very young. So I said, okay, I'll take that to grow. Why I have to look old now because my husband has died. And people would say, oh, Jody, you should go for therapy. You must be hurting. I'm here for you. I will do this for you. I'll listen to you. Call me. Well, I did not call anybody. What I did was I joined. And I went one day for psychotherapy. And just like your psychotherapist, he uh, didn't seem to be very interested. He was very indifferent. I told him I was a professional. And in the end, he asked me, did you work outside the home? I said, I, okay, I got it. <laughs> I don't have to go back now. So what I did was I um, joined a group of women who are uh, who were retired like myself. And they were doing a lot of creative things. And I wanted to be with them because I had uh, lost eight years of my life in caregiving. And I had even though I worked for 36 years, but those eight years made me seem like I was on my own. I, I had no connection with the society or the world or what have you. So anyhow, uh, I'm 70 years old and everybody says that you look 61, 62. I said, well, I'll take that because now I have a motivation to move on You know, <laughs> with that age because I kind of froze from 61 to 70. So now I can go back to 61 and grow. So that is my main uh, idea now to move on in life with a, a young, keeping in mind my young age. But my question to you is, when I started to do things for myself, I bought a beautiful painting kit that I thought I would one day start painting because I used to paint in the high school, not in college, not at work, but in the high school. I wanted to go back to that area. But I am so overly involved with my group and with the, this group and with the other things that I'm doing with, the, uh, with, uh, with other people that I don't now have the motivation to paint or even to take a pencil or a pen and just you know draw freely 
And I don't know whether that will ever come back because now I go on in another direction and I do meditation that keeps me focused. I have a schedule. I get up in the morning. I'm very spiritual. I had, that's one thing I did. Even when my husband died, I would get up in the morning and follow the same schedule that I used to follow with him. They get him ready, bring him here, give him breakfast, do whatever I did with him. I, I would do that. And yet uh, I was grieving inside. I was, you know, like every morning I would come, first I would cry and then I'd make my breakfast because that was the breakfast he used to eat. So my question to you is I still have a lot of um, creative ideas in my head, writing or painting and what have you, but I don't do any though any of those things and neither they make me feel guilty. They're all sitting there. I do write a journal though every now and then. But is it something that I can later on maybe when it will come back to me to go in that direction too? But if you don't do it, you lose it. I think yeah. that I, I think that's the big advantage of forming having private teachers. If you I would have one come to me once a week. And if you had a writing teacher, I had a poetry teacher. I forgot I meant I also had a poetry teacher and I would meet with them once a week and and it would be, and I meet for an hour or, or longer. And so that would kind of force me to, to think about and do. The, the problem is, is socializing and reading are, are activities that do not require practice as, as writing does, as yoga does, as playing the piano does, as, as, um, or as painting does, you have to practice that. And as the more you practice, the better you get at it. And the more you do it, the more you want to do it. And so, so if uh, whatever works for best for you, I think uh, the key is, is that I found that when my wife died, I was, I go back to when I was a graduate of, of school from college, I decided I wanted to be able to not depend on other people to help me emotionally. I wanted to be able to help myself. And that was my goal. And that's why, and I wanted to learn how to do that. And I, and my, I, like I said, I had a person that came, a, a, a therapist that came once a week and he encouraged me to do the things I wanted to do, not to do the things that I was expected to do. And, and I think it's good to be socializing, but I, myself, uh, I, I'm, I'm an ambivert. I, but I've learned this, that, that I need solitude time to go with my extroverted time. If we can go back to the Superman analogy, if we look at the last Superman movie, he was bullied when he was a little kid. And then when he bullied, his superpowers had to be used to fight the bullies. But even Superman needed his uh, place of solitude. His, what is it, uh, up in the Arctic, the, the, the Crystal Palace that he went to for the uh, Palace of Solitude. So we all need the solitude and we need to learn to like being with ourselves just as much as we like being with other people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jyoti. Thank you, Barry. Uh, next up is going to be Maxine, Jeff, Mushki, David, MP, Mike, and Jean. Maxine, go ahead. When I came this evening, I wanted to know if there was something that I wasn't doing. Uh, so I thought back over it after this little talk. And now I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> I never look back. I only look forward. So my husband died. I don't look back. That's a different part of my life. Uh, my mother died right after my husband. I don't look back. I look today, not too far forward, one day at a time. Um, I find that if you have a schedule every day and you build certain things in, it's very good. You don't get bogged down with garbage. Uh, you, uh, every morning I get up in the morning, I, my breakfast, I do a Zumba class every single morning because I want to be flexible. I walk every afternoon um, 
And uh, that keeps me uh, off the chair, in other words. Um, there is one activity that I can suggest for you, and that's to do breathing exercises, because if you are in the house with COVID and you don't speak, you lose your breath control. And so I have a master's in voice and I do those exercises every single day so that I don't lose my skills. My mother said, oh, I can't sing anymore, dear. She used to sing very well. I said, you'll sing. And I had a, 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 her, she had a companion. I said, let her sing patriotic songs every day. We sang God bless America and every other thing. And her voice came back and she sang beautifully. You have to keep up with everything. You have to have tons of hobbies. Now, I play every instrument. If I get bored one day, I'll go to the bassoon, I'll go to the violin, I'll sit at the piano. I'll sit, I will take a different thing every day so you don't get bored. You have to read, you have to do any hobby that you have, I knit, I crochet, I belong to different groups, and you never, ever retire. I still work, ever retire. Your brain goes to mush. And let me tell you, I joined these evening sessions with you to keep my brain from going to mush because I thought, well, look, I have all these hobbies, but what is going to help my brain? So I find that uh, when you have very intellectual discussions, it's really wonderful for me because I learn things. I learn how to deal with the things that they're talking about. I don't look backward for anything. You must, I raised my children. They, th I could say, well, more, I'm going to jump off a bridge. And they say, oh, that's nice. They allow <laughs> me to do anything that I want. Um, they are used to what I do. Um, I have never led a very uh, structured life. I was always a free spirit. So they're used to anything bizarre that I could do. And they're all talking to me. My grandchildren call me on the phone and say, look, we, we have to do this. How do we do this? I tell them and they hang up, but you know, uh, it's part of their life. I just told them they cannot call during school hours because that's not good. Um, you have to constantly move forward with your life. Do not look backward. It's deadly. And as far as people that are, go I don't allow anybody to hurt me or I don't want to hear their, uh, anything that's negative. I want to hear only positives. I have a girlfriend. She, she, I spoke to her today. I mean, she says, oh, no, she just had a knee replacement. I'm not going to ever have one. I had a rip rotator cuff. See this arm? I do arm exercises. I'm not going to get operated on. She said, oh, and my knee still hurts me. I thought, sure, you never get off a chair. How, is your, how are you going to get your knee back in gear? Um, <laughs> she, uh, she says, oh, and now I find that uh, when I watch TV and sometimes I crochet, I'm thinking, you're going to spend your life in a chair crocheting and watching TV. I mean, get out into the world and see the world. I mean, I'm still, I'm putting together musical programs and doing editing, you know, and arranging and stuff like that. I mean, really, you have to keep going. People, they don't look at you like you're old. Don't associate with, I hate old people. Just go with young people, look for, only do not allow yourself to even consider being old. You're not old. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you so much. Barry, would you like to say anything or shall we go? I can't, I am speechless at this point. <laughs> this is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maxine. I, when I do, I, actually, my yoga teacher uh, does teach me um, 
you know, uh, breathing exercises. I do it with my yoga and, uh, and there is a certain kind of breathing it's called oceanic breathing that she teach me. I think there is a hen, hen it's called prana. Maybe you can help me a little bit. Uh, pranayam, pranayam. Pranayam, that's it. Yep. And, uh, and that when we breathe, we need to, uh, when we breathe out, we need to empty our diaphragm. When we breathe in, we need to fill up our diaphragm, but sometimes we get it backwards. Because, and then she calls that a stress breathing. So breathing is a very important part. And so I, let me give you an example of it is uh, I went to the doctor for my exam and, and my blood pressure was 145 over 71. And, and so uh, they said, well, let's do it again. And so I did some breathing exercises and I meditated on my doing yoga in my basement and it dropped to 127. So uh, it's, it's very effective in, in reducing your blood pressure. And yeah, I, it's really important. Wonderful. Uh, I want to say that everything that Barry is saying or Maxine is saying, I mean, this is not about age. This is about just being human. I think it, is, it applies in spades to each and every one of us. You know, right. this is the way to live. And uh, I love Maxine's story about singing. You know, I, I sing Indian classical music and, you know, uh, what I do is that I walk on the streets of New York with my headphones, with the, the ryth rhythmic instruments playing and I sing. Now in New York, everybody thinks everybody's crazy anyway. So it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> so, uh, so I get, I, I get my walking in, uh, I need to walk, uh, which is very good for you. And it's, I can think and I can sing. So, um, so, uh, Maxine, that was amazing. Uh, next up is Jeff, Mushki, David, MP, Mike, Gene, and Marvin. Jeff, go ahead. So, Chicago, I'm out walking on the streets of New York. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> As you know, and, and you know, I, I sing out here occasionally too. Um, uh, but but I, I tone it down when I get close to someone. So, um, so Barry, I have, I have two questions for you. One, I wonder if you've ever um, uh, written down or you know, started writing down some of these kind of combinations of what they're either principles or kind of proverbial sayings, um, some of which kind of balance each other out, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, of, of time alone and time with others and and uh, creativity and, uh, you know, just all kind of, it's just interesting to me that, that there's balance being achieved even in um, your various uh, wonderful uh, proverbs, if you will. And then second, I'm wondering if um, in addition to these things that you're doing uh, to live your, your absolute, you know, best life as, as an individual, I'm wondering if there are any things that uh, you aspire to achieve in the world in some sort of, in any kind of greater purpose, um, either as a contribution or as service, or I wonder if there's anything like that. Is there any purpose that's beyond, um, you know, being all you can be as an individual? Well, right now I'm working on uh, converting, uh, I have a, I'm right, working on a, I call it maybe super age or growth path. path. I'm, I'm taking all my poems and paintings and, uh, and prose and put them in a book. And, uh, and, it's, and it is kind of a, it's my trajectory of my life. And, uh, and my, I think my greater purpose is, is, to, is to help people, especially as they grow old that, that I can best relate to to be all they can be. One of the big purposes I'm really concerned about is uh, they take old people, older people, and put them in assisted care places, and they put them in maybe nursing homes. And if they're gifted and highly sensitive, they deteriorate. And so I, I wanna, one of my goals is, is, to, is to provide places for them to go Maybe they don't longer can live in their own house, uh, and uh, 
so one idea I want to do is because it's very expensive to uh, to maybe have this uh, meditation garden inside your assisted care place that maybe what I might ha develop is a meditate uh, a mobile meditation garden that could uh, that you could take around to different assisted care places that maybe some older people could go in and and do the things they want to do but uh, do them alone I think the biggest issue is I have uh, is I do better creative things alone than I do with people. I don't like people looking over me and uh, judging what I'm doing. It makes me nervous. And uh, whereas you go to these assisted care places, everything is done in groups. And, uh, and they give this tiny little room and it's usually in the busiest corner of the, of the, of the city and there's no greenery and it's being proven that uh, and I was talking to Shrank about this is that that uh, nature has fractals and fractals uh, reduce your stress 60 percent. There's a fellow by the name of Richard Taylor that has done a study of Jack Pollock, who is a famous artist, used to drip painting like this onto a large canvas, and he'd throw one of the ones he didn't like and the ones he liked he kept. And he was intuitively developing fractals before they were even identified because fractals are repeating of over and over. The, the smallest, smallest part is the duplicate of the largest part, like a pine cone or like a nautilus shell. And, uh, and so I found being near nature is a, a fantastic way of being creative. If you look at all the Famous artists Van Gogh, Gauguin, Monet. They they had gardens. They they went out in nature and painted. And so, if you can bring nature into your house, but if you're in a assisted care place, they wanna they wanna make it all leisure activities. They don't want to push you. And so that's what my big that's my big um, mission is to change our culture, especially the older culture, to encourage people to get close to nature and to use their creativity in nature. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm what you call a biophiliac. A biophiliac is a person that is in love with living things. I don't like dead things. I like living things. And whenever I have a plant that's dying, I don't like it around me. I want to have, so I want to have living things. And that's why I put plants in my garden inside my house and it uh, gets my white carpet dirty and mm -hmm. and uh, makes it's kind of a hassle you got to water them and everything but I find it really is a very calming thing uh, to have nature close to you next stop no in New York I understand <laughs> I've been to Central Park and and uh, uh, if, if, uh, Barry Barry pe I also like life people are living too you know <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next up, next up is Mushki, David, and MP. Mushki. Hi, Barry. I really love everything you're talking about, and I'm obsessed with nature. And I'm, you know, it's hard to find nature in the city. There's a lot of people everywhere. But um, I wanted to ask you a few quick questions. One is, how do you use rejection to fuel creativity? I didn't understand that connection. For me, rejection, you know, makes stunts me, stunts creativity. So that's question number one. And question number two is, uh, how do you not play the comparison game? Because I used to be very creative as a kid, write a lot, draw a lot. And ever since the internet came out, and I see there are so many artists, there are so many writers, so many people, so much better than me. I think, what's the point? What's the point of putting a pen to paper? What's the point of drawing? <laughs> I, but as a kid, I, I had this ego. Oh, I'm such a good drawer. I, I, I'm such a good writer. So those are my questions. How do I not play the comparison game? And how do I use rejection to fuel creativity? Well, uh, I use rejection because I, I really see in my head those von Economo neurons are, are what I call social neurons. But if I'm rejected, those neurons are very unhappy and they, and they hurt and they cry. And so I say, well, I'm going to use my empathy on nature. I'm going to, instead of looking at people, I'm going to look at plants 
and I find I bond with nature just like I do with people. And I, when I bond with nature, I want to love it and I want to uh, recreate it. I want to reproduce it. And, I, and so the more I get out in nature and if I have the tools near, nearby, my writing tools, my painting tools, my music tools, I can, I, I'm inspired by nature to express myself creatively. And so I think the two are together spending more time in nature, but also thinking about, uh, you know, focusing and teaching yourself to focus on the beauty of nature and, uh, and, and corporate. And I always, in all my paintings, if you notice, I'm in the paintings, I'm in nature. And, uh, and I find out as I done 25 paintings, I begin to see the, the things that are common to them. And one of them is, is nature. And so I'd say, well, this, my paintings are teaching me something. I need to be more in nature. And the more in nature I am, the more I wanna be there. And uh, so, um, I don't know, uh, that's- Do that's you live in I, New York? Huh? Do you live in New York City? Do you live in New York City? I lived in New York. I've been to New York six times, and uh, but I live in Sherwood, Oregon. I would choose, I live in, so I live in a small town of 16,000 and I happen to have a three quarter acre piece of property. And oh, I have, wow. I mean, uh, and uh, so I have a large deck. On, I have a 2,500 square foot home and I have a, a deck over the full length and it looks out on the woods. And uh, so, uh, but I have neighbors that are noisy too. And, and, uh, and I'm very sensitive to sound. And, and so, uh, I have to either put on earphones or go inside. And, uh, but I, I think uh, you, as much nature as you can bring into your life, that will help you deal with rejection and as much creativity you can bring into your life, it will help you heal of rejection. That, uh, that's what I think. Thank you. Next. So thank you. one um, quick thing, or uh, can I make a response? Let's do one thing, Mushki. Uh, there are five people, and then we go okay, to okay, the sure. rooms, okay. and then we're going to have a chance for doing takeaways. <laughs> Please uh, hold off for for that for for the takeaway. Okay. Um, next up is going to be David, MP, Mike, Jean, Marvin, and Jenny, uh, and then we're going to go to breakout rooms. David, go ahead. A group here. Uh, Barry, great, uh, really great presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed your insight you. into the brain and the neurons. Um, Two quick questions for you. Um, one, do you incorporate meditation into your daily routine? And then the second is your journaling. Do you review your journals? And if so, how often do you go back and re 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 review what you've written in your journals? Yeah, I have journals that go back to 1985. I have, uh, and, and as time goes on, I. I keep more journals each day than I did before. And I do go back. So when I'm writing like a book, uh, I certainly go back and look at my journal or write an article. It, it's, and it, it refreshes my memory. Yes, I go back and look at them. And, uh, but often too, I find journaling does what Maxine, is it Maxine that said, I don't think about the past. Uh, well, I think journaling helps you do that. It, you write it down and you can, and you can kind of put it away. And so I think journaling does help you get rid of uh, some of the things in the past you've been and repeating over and over. And you know what Einstein said, uh, that uh, when you repeat uh, the same thing over and over and expect different results, that's your, a sign of insanity. <laughs> and uh, so, and your other question was what? My other question was meditation. Do you incorporate yeah, meditation? I, yeah, I yeah, like I say, I uh, when I so when I do yoga, I've uh, I have uh, stars on my ceiling, and I meditate on the stars. I've cre actually put them in my ceiling, and I have a big screen TV. I think you saw, and I have ocean flowing, and I found that ocean kind of puts you, it changes your brain waves into a theta state, and so. I, I meditate on those while I'm doing, but I find moving while I meditate is, is very effective because I have this 
I'm, I have a lot of energy, you know, and I'm, even though I'm 78. And then I read that the key to keeping alive is keep on moving. I'm always moving. I, even while I'm uh, doing, uh, I, tonight I was, uh, you know, doing mashed potatoes. I was listening to a book uh, for a book club I belong to. And uh, so I'm, I'm always uh, meditating on something while I'm doing something. I find it very, <laughs> just the way I, that's the problem with the, with all, when, when you're in school, they want you to sit still. They don't, and if you're highly active, I spent in my elementary schools most more times in the hallway than I did in the classroom. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, now that I'm older, I think that's what they want to do with older people. They want you to sit around and watch TV and, and drink coffee and, and whatever. And, but all the books say, and I, and my experience is keep on moving. It's that's what your body's for. It's not to sit around. Excellent. Uh, next up is MP, Mike, and Jean. MP. Okay. So thank you so much for this presentation, Barry. I'm so excited to meet another INTJ HSP. We are so rare. So I am so honored to 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 meet you here and to watch your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So that being said, um, I also want to add that I am a psychologist and I do work in nursing facilities and I see this all the time. Somebody with some, some type of vibrancy, but a medical underlying medical condition comes into short term rehab, something happens, they're not deemed to be able to go back home. And so then they go into short term, uh, long term care and then they just start to decompensate. I see the vitality, the zest for life, everything start to disintegrate. And it's really disheartening to see that as a psychologist and there are challenges in working with that and, and keeping their vitality um, still alive. So I thank you for this presentation. Um, that being said, um, I turned 50 during the height of the pandemic in New York City um, and so, uh, with that, um, I have found some underlying health challenges. Um, and also as an INTJ, HSP, highly sensitive female, I have grown up just feeling just out of place wherever I went, school, work, family gatherings, what have you. Um, just really, really out of place. And people, most people just kind of looking at me like they didn't know what to make out of my reactions because they may have been a little more intense, um, a little stronger than the average person, um, what have you. And a lot of INTJs and I have always said, God, we just feel like a, a part of a puzzle that just doesn't fit in anywhere, regardless of where we go or wherever we move. And, um, you know, I am disheartened to hear about your experiences with some family members. How do you navigate that? Um, being that these are close family members. Um, how do you na navigate that rejection and feeling bullied about, uh, by some family members in your life? Well, I keep my distance. And I guess uh, what I've uh, learned to do is, uh, is uh, it's kind of like what it says in the Bible, is somebody hurts you, pour coals on their head. And so I pour coals on their head by, by treating them nicely. Uh, right after my wife died, and my one of my sons just lit into me, and then I said, "Well, you know, you really do a great job. If you're complimenting your children, it's hard for them to bully you." And uh, so I sent my daughter uh, 36 uh, white roses for her birthday in November, and I sent my two of my children. I sent um, um, a centerpiece for Christmas. So I uh, I just show them kindness and love. And uh, with the hope that uh, they will respond to it. And if they don't, that's their problem. And, uh, but it makes me feel better. And that's the way I, I think. Uh, and you know, in that picture you saw me in the, in, for this presentation, I, it's a painting I did. And I, I always do a photograph. I take photographs and I combine them into a collage before I paint. And so that one where I'm sitting on a cloud over, over my yoga mat, well, that's an indication of what I'm talking about. It the storm is all this going on with your family and with other people, and you need to learn to rise above it. 
and and as a as you learn to float on that cloud, and you and you find a silver lining in that cloud, you're like Nick Jagger says, "Get off of my cloud." <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, next up is. <laughs> Next up is, uh, so it's going to be four, uh, four more, Mike, uh, Gene, Marvin, and Jenny, and then we're going to do breakout rooms. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, you, you give me some good pointers for if I ever get to be your age, what I need to do. Uh, and I thank you for that. I mean, I, I, it sounds like everybody else in the audience thanks you for that. Um, Plato had a theory, which may be apocryphal, that after you're 50, you start counting backwards. So you, you get to go go back another, you go back in years. That's uh, item. And the third item is the Czech scientists who developed the brain theory of GABA and large uni, u, neurons had some parallels to your journey. He didn't become a scientist. He became a scientist as his third career late in life. Uh, he he uh, did his brain work 230 years ago before Louis Pasteur and Jung and all the modern medical technologies. He had several abrupt career transitions like you did. As a younger man, he was a Catholic priest. He left the priesthood to get married to his beloved wife and his beloved wife died of thi typhoid after uh, while, uh, while the Romance was still in bloom. And after a period of mourning, he woke up and started writing books on physiology and medicine. And so he, uh, so my question to you was your mourning period, the epiphany that started you on your current uh, journey? Yes, it is. And, and uh, this is not uh, unique to me. Uh, Michelangelo's greatest accomplishments were after his mother died. And, uh, and Prost, he wrote some of his greatest books after, after his wife died. And there are several articles about this that, uh, uh, that's called post-traumatic growth. And uh, that after a traumatic experience like the death of a loved one uh, results in that uh, a change in your life and you begin and you begin to find those things that you were buried. And I think it is like, I use my me metaphor that uh, my wife is no longer there to regulate my slice gate to, to keep uh, from my being over flooded by my emotions. I have to do it myself or, or die. And uh, so that's what I decided to do is to live. And uh, many people die after, after they have a loved one. About 30% of them die after, the, soon after. In fact, that's what happened to Bush after his wife died. Uh, uh, remember that? And uh, George, uh, the elder George Bush, uh, his wife died and he died not too long after that. So. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jean, Marvin and Jenny. Jean, go ahead. Terry, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I wasn't uh, planning to come to this meeting because I, like you said, solitary is so important to girls, but I just can't help to check in. And I'm glad I joined. Actually, I really um, agree with what you said about people in America treat older people, because in other culture, they all respect, like in Chinese culture, they really respect older people. And, and but they also, you know, it's, I think in America, they play too much importance on the youth Actually, to me, people don't, our soul never age. We only, we only age physically. And so people don't really change spiritually, actually. I think they grow, but the, the true self don't really change. So, as, and also I found my own experience, I found I connect to nature, uh, future through my kids. I connect to the past through my parents. My kid just had an interview with my mom and I just realized she had been through Japanese invade China, Cultural Re Revolution, Big Famine, was like all these historical events he have been through. So like, I have no idea if not my kids interview her for the school project. I will never know about it. So it's kind of interesting how, I think the intergeneration relationship and also in general, the society, we can learn so much better and also cross-culturally too. 
I actually, at my landmark group, I shared, I said, in Seattle, we have so many diverse communities, but everybody live there in their small pocket. We could learn every culture in the city without traveling around the world. But people just miss that opportunity. So I think I really support you. And I hope your kids will come back and embrace you. You know, like, I think it's a great, you be yourself and keep your use as very important. And also another quick note is an architect. Actually, I'm actually thinking about design the retired community. The idea is like, everybody have their own small unit and they have the service cooking and the service, basic service together and they can live their individual life. At the same time, they have intergeneration people. Actually, somebody in Seattle trying to do that. So people actually like a big family, they help each other. You know, like the older people can help the kids, play with them, and then the younger people can. So they live like a big fa happy family. I think that's European doing that. So I think maybe we will learn to do that soon too in America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, next up is going to be Marvin and Jenny. Marvin, go ahead. Hi, Barry. I love your spirit and um, the, the um, vitality and, and, and the curiosity. Um, that's really uh, impressive. And I hope to see more and more retired people um, have that kind of lifestyle and, and that spirit. However, I'm just wondering, do you remember the movie Forrest Gump? Mm -hmm. Yes, that famous, famous scene when uh, Forrest Gump oh, was us. sitting. <laughs> yes, when he was sitting uh, on his front porch oh, and, uh, and he was mourning over uh, Jenny left him while he was uh, asleep. And you remember what he did after that? So he just stand up and start walking and, and he start running. Yeah, that's right. He kept running. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and then he just keep running. He just keep running. Right? And, and so, so um, that, that scene, it's, it sounds funny, but actually it has a lot of um, a wisdom in that because uh, it is one of the way that regulate your emotion. If you want to, re, uh, if you're mourning, you're under a lot of stress, you're under grief, running is the way to, to calm you down. Um, first of all, you have uh, circulation, you have oxygen going to your brain. And on top of that, you get the best free drugs, free drugs, 100% organic, homemade. <laughs> <laughs> by yourself, for yourself. And um, yeah, so, so another thing related to that is that there was a bunch of retired lawyers from New York City. They got retired, so they went out of the city and they went somewhere, I forgot where it was. And uh, so they start uh, doing trail running. And, and so they get together and, and they start training and run up and down the hill and they were on some trail. And they, they realized after like six months, they were more fit than they were in their 40s. And they, I think they were uh, 65, something like that. So, so the guy came back and wrote a book called Younger Next Year. So if you've got a chance to take a look at that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Thank you Marvin. Can I mention just one more last name? Yes, very quickly here. Yeah. Iron Nun, Iron Nun on YouTube. Search for Iron Nun. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Um, <laughs> folks, we are running a little bit late, so let's start the uh, breakout rooms. I'm going to start the breakout rooms so we can discuss these ideas and uh, for 20 minutes, and then we're going to come back and we're going to share our takeaways. Okay. Uh, Barry, this is just incredible. So I'm looking forward to seeing what people have to say. I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Yeah, I thank you. I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Barry for the presentation. It's inspiring. And um, it's also great to meet a fellow traveler who is following their own, their own path, as I have done throughout my life. It's great to, you know, I think the next thing, the next big thing in terms of, you know, ageism, you know, it's great that this is being addressed. And um, 
anyway, I just wanted to thank you for having this. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. All right. Uh, next up is going to be DW and uh, let's see. So DW, go ahead. And then Jenny N. One of the things that um, I found interesting in this talk is about how um, he was thinking about not stopping living. Okay. And one of my favorite sayings uh, by Helen Hayes is, if you sit, you rust. So, you know, for me, being active is a very um, organic thing to do. I have met several people in the last couple of weeks where they're, you know, because of this COVID situation, they feel so isolated, so bound up. And I'm going, you know, I just don't feel that way because I can, I'm self, um, I'm self-directed, you know, in my age group. And, um, you know, most people don't know that I'm in my 70s. And, you know, they think that I'm in my 60s. But, um, you know, I think it's a matter of perspective. I think if you like Bar like Barry was saying, is that, you know, you have to constantly think, you know, what's next, how to, you know, how to live, how to breathe, um, how to think creatively, instead of just stagnating, you know, just because you are physically retired from work, it does not mean you're, you're physically retired from life. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, DW. Next up is going to be Jenny N. Uh, let's see, Jenny N, Steph, and Stefan, uh, Stefan Bertiloni. Jenny, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, um, great presentation. Um, really inspiring. And uh, we had a good chat then in our group. And I guess just the takeaways are participating in groups like this, you know, actually our group was talking about some other good groups when this one doesn't have anything going on and and exercise is real important, you know, getting out and, and um, walking and just, you know, using your body. So thanks again. It was very inspiring. Wonderful. Thank you, Jenny. Next up is Steph, Stefan Bertiloni and Sonia. Steph. Okay. Is it me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought it was great. I loved Barry's comment about socializing and then actualization. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I want to move more towards actualization. I do tons of learning. I've enjoyed this tremendously, but I feel like I want to do something um, with the knowledge. But I really am inspired by Barry, his university format. Uh, I think it's good to get a teacher involved because uh, you can drive yourself a bit more. Uh, so thank you, Barry. That's it. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Steve, followed by Sonia. Steve, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would sum it up basically is go ahead and do stuff. Um, it, it does seem to me that balance has always been important. Otherwise, you get either people that don't think at all or get too much in their head. So we were talking about the balance that he had. And um, yeah, I have also had issues with people that no matter what you do, they never have anything good to say. And yes, you just have to be very selective with it. Uh, unfortunately, this whole COVID is making it a little harder to socialize, but basically we've still got time to do things, so you should just go ahead and do them. Wonderful. So that's Thank my takeaway. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next up is Sonia, Laura, and Jairo. Sonia? Don't know whether you can unmute or not. Okay, next up is Laura and Jairo. Laura? Okay, um, Jairo? Uh, so uh, I just thought of a question. Yeah, I have a lot of, to take away, but but I, I, I wish I could ask the, uh, Barry a question like, like does he uh think about death and without getting depressed like does he think about it to kind of motivate him to to uh do like uh do a hundred percent kind of like that 
Sure. We, we can, we'll, we'll open it up later on uh, for questions. So uh, Barry can respond to anything at that time, but I want to have, okay. let everybody have their say, and then we'll open it up. So next up is okay. Anna followed by Brian. Anna. Okay. Next up is Brian. Brian, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I enjoyed uh, the, the presentation. It, it was very good. Um, I, I too have been retired uh, a number of years, about five years actually. Um, and I, I went from quite an active life as an engineer um, into my current retirement state. Um, I managed to walk for an hour twice a day. Um, I spend the rest of the day and most of the night, most of the evening, either reading, writing, um, or painting. So my, my day is very full. I probably have less spare time now than when I was working, although what I do now is what I call spare time when I was working. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next up is going to be David, Ed, and Jean. David. So uh, great presentation, Barry. What I... I think my takeaway is I, I like the concept of the university. And I think I might uh, try to incorporate that into my own organization of the different activities that I'm engaging with. Uh, uh, and then the other thing that I find that's been beneficial to me is um, engaging with others to you, so you get some degree of accountability uh, so that as you're doing things, you have somebody else that you're trying to keep engaged or you can use them as a sounding board to keep you motivated so that you don't, you know, kind of just say, well, it's, it doesn't really mean anything or it's not really that important. And I, and I found once I've gotten uh, um, people that were, that I'm in interacting with and, and these groups, the, the meetup groups that you have going on is fantastic because it makes me now read books and stuff like that and and look at things so I, I just can't let it push it off because the meeting is going to happen and you know tomorrow so you got to get up to you know get engaged so you can participate but uh finding that level of, of accountability i think also helps keep thing keeps the process moving and it, and it, and it doesn't allow you to kind of you know relax a little bit and you know kind of push things off to the future so great again, Barry. Love the topic. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jean. Jean, go ahead. Uh, Ed, sorry. Ed followed by Jean and then Judith. Ed. Barry, I see you almost as a soulmate. And I hope in 10 years from now that I could be as good a man as you. You have to kind of keep moving along, doing things, just do Every day you try to pursue your dreams and don't worry about what other people think. Uh, it's, it's all, you know, garbage anyway. You have to make your own you know, way in the world and you're doing that. And I think it's terrific. And again, I, uh, it was an excellent presentation. I just wish that there were more people uh, in your age bracket like you. So keep on uh, moving along. Thanks again. Thank you, Ed. Uh, next up is Jean, uh, Judith, and Joe. Jean. Yeah, uh, today we have discussion group. I found it's quite interesting. And someone shared they had they experienced the same kind of ageism. I think maybe we should start a new movement. They already have racism, you know, gender discrimination and age. It's also people experience it. And I also realized, you know, people like like Jody Peterson mentioned and order and chaos, the reason people like to hang out exactly the same type of people, same age, same background, same, you know, everything because they're afraid of chaos. But the thing is, the only area we can learn is with the people very different. We can't learn anything new with people exactly like us. So I think it's very important to diversify and the experience is in life is so important because that's why they read the book from the past because that saves your years of experience. So we really need to embrace this diversity, you know, in age, in everything. 
Uh, absolutely, Gene. I couldn't agree more. That's why I'm in New York. And that's why I run the meetups in New York, because people from all kinds of all over the world, from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of ages would show up. And that's the same thing that is happening here. So absolutely. Uh, next up is Judith, uh, Joe and Jeff. Judith. Yeah, I agree to um, the diversity comment, because I was just thinking, you know, how um, a sense of community is necessary for that accountability that David was talking about, because uh, that's just something that um, I'm thinking, you know, ahead to retirement, because so much of my life is so busy now with work, but I'm trying to add those things in and try to picture and like, want to imagine that I will, you know, be accountable. Like I, there are things I love to do. And then sometimes I don't do them and I don't know why, you know, like, why wouldn't I be painting if that's what I want to be doing? And once I do it, I'm so much in the zone, you know? Um, so I think a lot about that. And it, so this was wonderful um, comments everybody made, you know, Barry, and then all, everyone's comments, very, very interesting. So I found it very worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, next up is Joe, uh, Jeff, and Jyoti. Joe? Yes, thank you again for presenting tonight, Barry. It was fantastic. Uh, I mean, the idea of treating your uh, treating ourselves like systems is a really critical concept as far as establishing balance. And that is, you know, that's that was something that become really clear to me uh, this evening. The other is the idea of post-traumatic growth. And the reason why that's so critical to the conversation is it's not just a specific uh, event but we all experience trauma in our lives and therefore how we handle that trauma and the idea of hope that comes along with it is a part of getting older. You're starting to get older and then you're growing and it gives you an idea of hope past any trauma, major traumas and minor traumas. So I think that that's, uh, that's a really important concept uh, because you're constantly moving forward and no matter what happens. So when you're talking about ageism or you know growing old gracefully, I think that that's a critical concept to really wrap our heads around. So that's something that I'm gonna walk away with as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. And I do think that uh, you know from what I can tell, Barry is growing younger. So I don't know who it was. It was, I think, uh, Mike who was pointing out that you know after 50, you're supposed to grow one age. So he's now 22. So I look forward to him being, you know, 18 and then 16 and then two. So uh, next up is Jeff, Jyoti and Kevin Callahan. Jeff. So, so Barry, thank you so much for this. It, it's so rich and it, and it generated a, an amazing conversation in our, in our breakout. Um, and uh, the question, one of the questions that was raised in our, in our breakout was it wasn't raised in exactly this way, but it was a little bit uh, about why do anything. And your um, your motivation and sense of purpose and and being really uh, driven to uh, do all kinds of things that challenge you to get better, as well as sort of invite all these different aspects of yourself. To uh, to create, uh, you know, from from art to writing, from poetry to uh, yoga, from you know, just from music to reading, to I mean, so many different things, as well as engaging with all of us here, and then you know, your aspiration to see how you might be able to contribute to providing those kinds of opportunities and um, you know, for for others. Uh, in it, however it might be structured, I think is amazing. And, and I, I really hope you pursue it and look for the opportunity to do that because I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's a pretty big deal. So I hope you get the chance to explore that. Anyway, you generated a very rich, I think, reflection for each one of us as well as conversation. And, and you really always do that in this group. And I, I wanna thank you for doing it in such a full way this evening. And that's about all I have to say for now. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is Jyoti, Kevin Callahan, and Kevin Sue. Jyoti. So uh, 
I had a privilege of having Barry in my breakout room. So I told him a few things, asked him a few things about grief and what have you. So I'm not going to touch those points. But what I wanted to tell the group was, I think the key factors to a, a graceful aging is starts in your 40s, which I have started to do. Uh, good nutrition, uh, exercises, uh, good attitude, and spirituality. I think once you have that under your belt, then you welcome aging uh, very uh, in a very appropriate manner. And that gives you a motivation to stay young in your life. And then what Barry mentioned, all those things are additional assets in your age. So Barry, you have given me motivation now to go and pursue painting and writing. So I think this was great. Well taken, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jyoti. Uh, next up is Kevin Callahan, Kevin Sue and Linda, uh, Linda Mons. Kevin Callahan. Uh, is it for me or yes. Linda? No, Kevin. Oh, um, yeah, there were two uh, takeaways I thought were very thought provoking in our uh, discussion. One was that assisted living facilities and long term care facilities need to change and we need to push for that. Uh, it, they lack nature, they lack individual spaces like art studios. Um, and this idea of everybody being in a group activity is not really healthy, especially for introverts. And the second point was that uh, introverts process dopamine differently, which I did not realize. And um, so uh, they become gr good at becoming polymaths and they need to create metaphors and art and all those things. So I had two takeaways, which I think are things I'm gonna think a lot about in the future. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up is Kevin, Sue, uh, Linda, Mons, and Laura. Thank you, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Barry, for your awesome uh, presentation. Yeah, you start your Barry University. I think everybody else should start your own university soon. And um, I a good idea. I would say consider age as a discrimination. People talk about it. So, it's not what you see, it's about your intent to label those. Another one is it's hard to notice fights. Like when uh, uh, um, Barry said, adorable, cute, as negative, I think about my own language. Consider let's see how to talk to uh, like friends older than me. So we need to learn each other's reform language and the purpose. I know the language itself is not enough. It's it have own bias, when a different uh, context and it's a different meaning, and a different culture. Um, my takeaway is, uh, yeah, share share your wisdom. You know, you know, obviously, elderly is the the treasure. It's not uh, uh, something else. They have wisdom. They can, you know, younger people not experienced. I will learn learn from it, and better. You are the, my, um, I guess, the hero, and uh, you can build a spaceship as use your um, polymath skills. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up is uh, Linda Mons, uh, Laura, and Maxine. Linda. Barry, thank you so much for what you've shared today. Uh, I'm very impressed by by how you you are handling aging, uh, and I want to handle it as well myself. Uh, you've been I know you've inspired me to look at my life more closely, and I think you've inspired many of us too. And I wish you a very happy 2021. Uh, go out there and conquer. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Linda. Uh, next up is Laura, Maxine, and. Um, Mike, Laura. Okay, next up is uh, Maxine, Mike, and MP. Maxine. Barry, thank you very much for this presentation. 
um, I think you're on the right track. And um, attitude is so important um, at this particular time. I have tremendous longevity in my family. And um, one grandmother lived to be 104 and the other one was 99. And they would say to me, you know, no matter how old you get, you still want to live. And that, that was wonderful because she said it to the other one who was 104. And I would say, look at that person playing the piano and they're over 100. And my grandmother would say, yeah, and they're playing the same as the people that are under 100. So uh, really, it's very important to have an attitude like that. That promotes longevity. Um, as far as uh, the 99-year-old, the 104 year old one when she was 99 she expected to die and she sat there and looked at a wall for a whole year didn't eat didn't sleep and at the end of the year she realized she wasn't going to die so then we started we took her out we took her to play speedball down Atlantic City we took her all over and she was wonderful uh, and she lived to be 104, but she had to convince herself that she uh, everything was okay. So I may as well go on with my life. And that's what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you. Uh, next up is Mike, MP, and Mushki. Uh, well, engineers and scientists, particularly in large organizations, learn how to keep a logbook uh, for their everything they do. I visualize that became your journal in your new journey. Uh, second thought is stay active, stay positive. Uh, Ari, post-traumatic growth, Nietzsche said anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is uh, MP and Mushki. MP. So I really um, value the feedback and the insights about accountability and challenging yourself for growth, but also not to push yourself too fast and too hard uh, because that can backfire too. So to maintain that balance, um, to grow older healthfully, most absolutely. And as an INTJ, highly sensitive person, um, you know, it's really, it's, it's really heartening to see someone using older years, chronologically anyway, um, and the gifts of being highly sensitive and the gifts of also being a thinker synergetically. Um, on my 50th birthday, we had a Zoom party because it was the height of the pandemic and I had very conflicting feelings about turning 50. It was a relief on one hand as an old soul, but it also brought up some angst due to um, a lot of internalized ageism. So uh, I, you know, I, I really value this in that I, I want to be more self-aware of my own ageism and not let that get in the way of my own development and to also continue and be motivated to synergetically use my gifts. Thank you. Thank you, MP. Um, oh, I forgot uh, Marvin. So it's going to be Marvin followed by Mushki. Marvin, what is, what's your takeaway? Yes. Um, one of the things that I uh, caught my mind about what Barry said was um, he discovered that his, uh, his emotion. And I'm at this phase that and I'm discovering uh, emotion as the... the um, the other depth of uh, the personality, and I'm kind of dived in and and learning a lot about emotion, emotional intelligence, and and love, and and all that good stuff. Uh, there is a uh, uh, native tribe that has a, a saying that the longest journey in life is that from the mind to the heart, and I think. Uh, Barry, you have made that journey, and I'm I'm on my way. Um, one other quick thing during our breakout is uh, related to assisted living, and it it seems like the current status quo doesn't is inacceptable, and there's there are no other solution on 
on the horizon. And I just thought uh, uh, perhaps um, we can borrow a page from young people going to college. What they do is that they cannot afford to have their own apartment, so they get together and have roommates. So they organize themselves and they, they pick people that they get along with and, and um, it seems to work out for them. So maybe um, when we get to that age, instead of going to the assisted um, living, like you go to the dorm in the, the college, you just find your roommate and, and organize yourself and, and, and have a party. <laughs> That's an excellent idea. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, next up is uh, Mushki. Mushki, go ahead. Okay. This was this was really great meetup. So my takeaway is that I'm going to start writing again, poetry. Um, you were discussing poetry's ability to take complex ideas and put in simple words. And I really like how you express that um, poetry for me is very cathar cathartic, but I felt that poetry is not good and that I could only write if it's good. I need to contribute to society with my poetry, but no, it's okay to write poetry for myself and I could come as a more full human being to society by fulfilling all the parts of me that make me happy. I don't need the po poem to be a good poem for other people to like it. So I was very inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Mushki. Now, uh, Barry, uh, it's your turn. Uh, you can respond to anything. One more talk about. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I read a poem. No longer tired. I'm inspired and wide. Just <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm no longer tired. Inspired and wired. <laughs> thank you, uh, Barry. So uh, you can respond to anything. You can uh, talk about your takeaways, anything that you want to talk about. Go ahead, sir. Well, I'm encouraged by your encouragement. Uh, um, I th one, one person talked about death. Well, Eric Erickson was a famous psychology psychologist who developed uh, different stages in life. And the last stage of life is called the eighth stage, if I remember right. And he said, we have a choice as we do in every stage of life. We can either choose despair or integrity. And uh, despair leads to death. Integrity leads to authenticity, being who you are. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I found that I'm a biophiliac. And that means I want to be alive. I don't want to die. My wife didn't want to die when she died. They thought they thought I was so it was really funny when I was in the hospital the weekend before she the week she died, the doctor thought I was the one who was keeping her alive. No, I was keeping her, I was helping her to fulfill her desire to keep alive. We all want to live. Nobody wants to die. And and the problem is we have we, we allow other people to make us want to die. And uh, that's what I think. And I think we naturally are all drawn to life. And, uh, and we're here born for a purpose. And where purpose is to live and live to its full potential. And, uh, and the trouble is the almighty dollar gets in the way of uh, us being human. And we treat ourselves like numbers rather than people. And, um, and that's what they do in, uh, when you're young and when you're middle-aged and when you're uh, older, especially when you're older and they think this is a chance to, to suck all the money out of you they can. And I think we need to stand up to this and say enough, enough. We, and I like the idea of forming our own assisted care plan and it would be called, uh, and it could be co-ed or, or it could be just all boys and all girls, whatever, and whatever we want. And I think uh, we make the life we choose to make. And if we allow the other people choose it, we get what we deserve. That's kind of kind of why I look at it. And uh, uh, just like uh, Nietzsche said, what makes me, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And that is true with other people as they, 
And I would not have found this group. I'm, I can say that again, I would not have found this group if it hadn't been for another group I joined. And then, and this one person got really nasty with me. And I said, I'm not going to put the energy in uh, to anybody that is not supportive of me. They're not worth my time. And I think that's what happens when you get older, because you have less years, you count the years, and there's less of them. And so you have less time to screw around. Your time is limited, use it wisely. And uh, that's the, the way I look at it, instead of saying, oh, I only have a few lay, well, that means you got to really do something with that few time you have. I think that's the, that's the, what I learned as an engineer is, is you make do with what you have and don't uh, give up because you don't have much left. You make do with what you have. And I, I like living in my house. I like to live independently, but I always am anxious about there be a time that I would have to be dependent on other people. And, uh, but I don't wanna be. And so I'm gonna try to develop a plan that prevents that from happening. That's that's the, the INTJ in me is to, I plan everything. Everything I do is now as a result of a plan. It's, and uh, life is not an accident. It's a plan. And, uh, and he who plan, doesn't plan gets what he gets. So I think it's important to plan yourself. Uh, nobody else will and uh, have goals and plan. And that's uh, what makes us different than the animals. They don't plan, they act on instinct rather than, um, that's what I think. And, uh, but I think the big thing I guess I want to leave with you is that, that uh, our, is so much of what we do is taught by our culture and by our parents and by our, and I call them the seven Ps, uh, uh, I call it your parents, your peers, your pedagogues, your professionals, your partners, your preachers, and your progeny. And I think, uh, and uh, those people are the ones that, that mold you. And I think if you live long enough, it's a time to mold yourself. And that's what the theory of positive disintegration about is getting rid of the things that society taught you and embracing the things that make you who you want to be. And that's, uh, and incidentally, there is a, Theory of Positive Disintegration um, Facebook uh, page, and I suggest you join it. And there is also a uh, conference they put on every other year, and I spoke at one of them in 20, 2016, and uh, about, um, it's called, and it's on YouTube, it's called uh, uh, Positive Disintegration Through the Loss of a Spouse. And uh, and it's kind of the beginning of this journey I have since uh, my wife died. And I, and I recognize that, that uh, this makes my children uncomfortable, that I grow as a result of their mother dying. They think I should be grieving. Well, I have grieved, but, part of the, but there's growth with grief. And, uh, and I think the attitude with most young people is death is, to be, is, a, is a river on the Nile. It's denial. And that's and anything to do, we live in, and I think that's the big advantage of the Indian culture, for instance, from India. They all, generations live under one roof and they see death and they see, they learn from each other. And they looked up to the older and they, for respect and for knowledge. And uh, Moses was 85 when he led the people out of Israel, uh, the Israelis out of Egypt. And uh, so uh, our attitudes about age is wrong. And it's at a time when technology allows us to live much longer. There's a, there's a paradox here, isn't there? <laughs> I guess that's my takeaway. Wonderful. Uh, Barry, Thank you. This, this is an incredible honor. And uh, we are just, all of us are just delighted, not only for your presentation, but your regular participation in this Every time you speak, you bring your spirit into this group. Uh, Thank you. And, and it's a kindred spirit, spirit. You know, this, you know, this is what like many people you can see, like Maxine and the the the, the amount of 
resonance that you got from on everything that you said it's just incredible so very very much honored sir thank you very much thank you Bye. thank you Bye. let me speak thank you